Good afternoon, everybody out there. Can you guys hear me okay? Let's do a volume check. Let's see if I can uh, pull up the chat room. It is. Hey, I can see you guys in there. I'm squinting. Dr. V, good to see you. Very good to see you. Robin, good to see you. Rick. Rick, good to see you. Tommy, good to see you. Good to see you gentlemen in there and you ladies of grace. Little one. Who else it? Caroline. We have a bunch of people in there. It's good to see everybody. You guys know what the title of the uh, broadcast is today. Are you ready to see? Are you ready to see? Simple, isn't it? One way or the other, we're going to break this paradigm of us being know-it-alls. How about that? We're going to break that down all the way down. How many uh, folks in here with a partial scientific background too i'm gonna give you something for free today so hopefully you can come especially the science team you guys can ponder something right ponder it it's a funny thing when you when you know something and you're trying to convey it to your friends and family in every single case you have to do so very cautiously Premature knowledge given at a premature point can be useless to utter. In a lot of cases, you can say a truth that won't take root. It'll be lost and forgotten. So timing is everything. Just like the world, um, it, it is seasoning people for the change. So does the Father give us his understanding precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. That same process has been the process of you all, even me, gathering truth, right? Because we certainly occupy the days the children of men are being gathered to a degree, thrust into a new time period, right? As I said the other day, I call that the age of the Lord. That's what I call it. The age of the Lord. Because it's a, it's the time of Christ, right? Just like we live in the days of grace and mercy. The days of redemption, salvation. Right? So we also will occupy another age or another time interval that will deal with the with the actual judgments of our Father upon the earth. We will attempt to continue to define why we're here. It's, a, it's no good for a person to walk around life purposeless. You don't really know your purpose in this earth. It's, it's quite simple. But the problem is we've been programmed. We have been embedded with a teaching that is fall, flawed to a degree. You see, mankind can only teach you those things that they're aware of. I can assure you that no man on the face of the earth is aware of always. But there is one that is modeled for us, given a name, Jesus of Nazareth, that we are to follow. We find ourselves having issue or trouble doing this because so many other ways conflict with it. And so simple understandings become very complicated. Even the nature of existence is an enigma to most 
people don't know why they're here. They don't. And so as a result of that, they, all, they, they find themselves hunting and searching for purpose and meaning to their lives. And their lives are already purposed. And they have great meaning. Right? <clears throat> Let me give an example of that. You guys are aware of CERN, correct? Everybody, everybody should be aware of CERN. Right? I'm going to share something with you about CERN. It's very simple. Not so difficult to comprehend nor understand. But it's a different way of thinking. I'm going to use that as an example. And I'm not making up a story when it comes to CERN. Let's just say this is something I know. You know what you know. I know what I know. I will not utter a made up thing about CERN. Not going to do that. I have no interest in doing that. But everybody has heard of the magnetos, uh, the magnetic field around the Earth, right? You guys have heard about that. Did you guys know in history you can track the strength of the magnetic field by the material in the Earth? Right? Here's one thing that we do know. Over the course of many, 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 many years, there have been collapses of the magnetosphere. The magnetic field around the Earth has collapsed more than once. Every single time it collapsed, this is what you don't know, a spiritual authoritative figure was on the Earth. Why do they coincide? Why? Hmm. Well, you have to understand the nature of the magnetosphere in the first place. Well, the magnetic field, a magnetic field is generated by the movement of electrons, right? Charged particles that are not attached to anything yet or have no cause and effect, that are not captured. They will always follow the lines of force in a magnetic field, always. Even with the Earth, when solar winds hit the Earth, those charged particles from the sun are captured or redirected by the magnetosphere around the Earth. And they're sent to both poles. Based on their polarity, they will go to either one of the poles. When they do so, you, that's where you get the auroras. Those are high-altitude collisions. Based on the altitude and the particle it's colliding with, you get different colors. From there, those charged particles are absorbed by the Earth. So then the solar winds regenerate the Earth all the time. And the solar winds never, ever stop blowing. Never. They never stop blowing. Right? But it is the magnetic field lines that direct those charged particles. So magnetic field lines, in a way, become a highway for charged particles. Cosmic rays, which come from deep space, not from the sun in a like manner, are redirected by the heliosphere, which is a larger magnetic field around the entire solar system. And they do penetrate and come in. That's what's happening now. And the Earth begins to absorb a different type of energy. Now, the sun does this, too. The sun's magnetic field spans the entire solar system. Our magnetic field spans a pretty good distance outside of Earth. I mean, a really big distance. But the sun is doing something like the earth does. It's beginning to absorb. It, well, let me, let me back up. If we have a flare or see me, let's just say we have a see me. And it's polarized just right. Right? Just right. We're going to have spectacular auroras. If it's polarized just right, the earth will absorb it. Solar storms, same thing. All right? Spectacular light shows in the heavens, right? Well, the sun is doing the same thing. Because with the cosmic rays that are coming in, the sun is now beginning to absorb a lot of energy. Lots of energy. I mean a lot. And it's sucking it all up. 
what will eventually happen is our solar cycles are going to be shuffled. It's going to be very difficult to all, all the charts and every ladies. You're sensitive to the cycles of the sun, just so you know. Your bodies are very susceptible to the magnetic pulses of the sun itself, just so you know. Because your body clock is tied to it. Right? Other life forms are tied to it also. And then some life forms are tied to, of course, the natural processes of Earth itself. But that's, we're talking about the magnetic field. All right? So it redirects charged particles. The Earth has had a magnetic field pulse or wave in, in a, about seven times, 7.xx to 15.xx pulses per second. Right? A lot of people call this the Schumann uh, frequency. It too is altering. It's intimately tied to the magnetosphere, to the shielding around the Earth. So you have all these elements tied together, right? The shield around the Earth protects us from what? Charged particles, energy. That's what I want you to know. The shielding around the Earth protects us from energy, unwanted energy. Right? Just like the atmosphere will filter out certain uh, bandwidths of light, like ultraviolet and, and all those things. They become filtered out. The shielding around the Earth also does something in a like manner, but it redirects it harmlessly inside of the Earth. Okay? But it's redirecting energy. Energy. Now that you know that, it redirects energy. Which means if it were not there, what would happen? It would not redirect energy. We would be susceptible to high doses of radiation. Correct? We wouldn't last long. The solar winds would fry everything in, their, in, 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 in its path. We would just, we wouldn't, we'd have to go underground pretty quick. Now, these, any underground facility, given a certain depth, can protect you from highly charged particles. It can. In fact, it does not have to be too deep. It doesn't. It just needs to be uh, fortified, of course, for shell movements or crustal movements. So then, underground bases can protect the, those who go in them from what? What will it protect them from? The radiation coming from the sun. Because the sun is going to absorb cosmic rays anyway and then utilize them, shooting them back out in space. Which is what it does all the time. And it redirects uh, a certain ways. So you have a the, the heliopause, constantly pushing solar winds are very important. And it is a mystery as to how this, it's, it's a mystery to certain scientists. Because every CME is an important process. Without the CMEs and the flares that the sun has had, portions of the heliosphere would be collapsed. And so it amazes them how the sun reacts. They're trying to... Figure out the dynamics of CMEs and solar flares in relation to the external portions of our solar system. Because every time there is a hole in that shielding, and they can see this through certain spectrums and analysis of wavelengths and probes, every time there's a hole, a CME goes off filling that hole up, or strong solar winds will go in the direction of the weakness of that field, which is amazing. It's almost like the sun is a component not just a ball of fire, but a controlled component. Right? So naturally, they're going to search it out because it that, that doesn't support any type of a, a, a Darwin jargon. It doesn't support that. That would imply that the sun is under uh, control. Right? Now, our way of thinking is messed up because when I say something like that, people go, oh boy, here we go. The sun is this. Well, listen. Wouldn't it be amazing to you to see a seed in the soil? And before you know it, for push, there's a specific type of plant that comes out of that one seed. That seed was pre-programmed to be what it is. Just like the sun 
is pre-programmed to do what it does. You see, so if your thought process changes, where you can actually see God's creation, it really is not a big deal, but it's normal. This is the Father's creation, it's normal. So the Son has been engineered to do what it does. Just like a seed has been engineered to grow like it does. And that's why we have geneticists engineering other plant life, other forms of plants and everything else. You see, they sit there on one side of their mouth and they say, well, there is no great creator. But in the other side, they're saying, oh, look at what we created. We spliced this seed and that seed and now we have this. Well, here, here's a fact. If through natural selection, plants are what they are today, right? They wouldn't be able to alter the genetic foundation of too many things. See, that throws, if you study deeply, genetics, you begin to see something. Those nucleic acids, those are bonds that can't easily be broken nor manipulated unless... They had something called hinges. Think of it. If a door has a hinge, that means somebody put it there, right? It didn't evolve. If you want the door changed, you're going to have to remove the hinges and put them on another door. And this is what they're finding, the hinges to many things. If it were not designed, it wouldn't have hinges. They don't want to tell people that. So what they do is they hide it in scientific publications. And the language is so expansive that the average person, there's no way in the world they could ever find out what they're saying. So they hide these things in published papers. But the average individual cannot interpret what was written. Right? In like manner, so are the components in space. Now mankind, they do manipulate crops and fields and plant life. Right? They also desire to manipulate or take control of the earth. Just like they desire to manipulate and take control of diseases. Just like they desire to manipulate and take control of all births. Right? So what I'm telling you is that the children of men or humanity itself is preoccupied with controlling creation right now. That's called dominance. Right? Dominance. Have you ever noticed that on um, all armed services, uh, primary, let's just say uh, spearhead agendas, the word domain is often used, right? To take control of a domain, a region, an area, a portion of something. This is in the hearts of men to control their situation. Even as a Christian, you guys speak it all the time. You try to establish your own order into everything that you see. And if it's somebody else's order and you don't agree with it, you're going to walk away with them. Because it's in your flesh to dominate something. And if you're too little, you're going to dominate a, a teddy bear or something. You will dominate something. You will. So now, when you think in this mindset, what I'm about to tell you is not going to be very complicated to understand because it has to do with the uh, deal with CERN that shielding around the earth is a highway just like in the galaxy those magnetic field lines in the galaxy are a highway for charged particles right a highway since the uh, what was it the 30s or 20s actually it shouldn't be a mystery that many people with a lot of money who have achieved, or they have all the money they want, they, they ultimately start drifting over into a type of witchcraft. Right? See, once you accomplish everything on the earth, and you no longer have to work for a reward or anything else, your mind changes. You start contemplating, thinking of different things, and in most cases, these guys result to a type of witchcraft. When you achieve a point of dominance, you always want more. And so they begin to investigate the spiritual realm. And they spend trillions of dollars doing so. And equipment and everything else. Here's how they do that. In the 20s it began. In fact, what you guys call Area 51 
That had to do with a guy named Jack Parsons. It did. And some other folks who did some incantations. Well, right after the incantations, many lights start showing up all over the place. Now, let me tell you who's not innocent. Einstein wasn't innocent. That Klavosky woman, he had all her writings. He knew about the other side. So does Bill Gates. So do all these, these, these multi certainly if they're dealing with technology. They want that. They, they need contact from the other side. They need to be inspired. It's like a book writer who gets writer's block. They will pay a doctor, psychiatrist, anybody they can find millions of dollars to help them reestablish their momentum, their inspiration for writing. They do it all the time. Because when they have writer's block, the creativity is gone. When that's gone, so is their life. Right? They can't do anything. And so they'll pay any amount of money to get it back. Well, when you have already conquered everything in the world, there is one domain you can't conquer. You begin to wonder, is this it? Is this all that I am? Doesn't matter who you are, it hits your mind. Is this it? This all of who I am. In fact, in the course of your life, when you have accomplished goals that you wanted to accomplish, you were bored. You worked your life to accomplish a goal. When the goal was met, when you met that goal, you became bored again. Some of you retired, and you worked your life to be retired, but once you were retired, you said, wait a minute. This isn't, uh, you know, I'm bored. So what do you begin to do? You begin to investigate new avenues of inspiration, something that fulfills you. Well, for these folks of power who control these power centers around the globe, they go into the spiritual domain is what they do. They've always done that. Right? Because they do that. Different scientists, or, or let's just say something like scientists, science was born out of that and so you have rituals all over the face of the earth in fact it, it's almost impossible for most people to identify the rituals it's almost impossible for that to happen because every body alive if you have if you have watched television you have participated in a ritual your participation was everything if you were emotionally moved during a presidential election, no matter what it is, no matter if you were angry or happy, you participated in a ritual. They call it the anointing. You did. Through your emotion, that raw emotion, things are given power. Gates are opened. Right? So you participate doing this. Why do you think that after every, at every single election, the world goes upside down and the residue of those, of the elections is, 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 is just long term. It changes you as a person. But you participate in a ritual. It's what you do. A ceremony. When you're emotionally moved like that, you open up the door of desire. And it just so happens that the doorway to the other realm is desire. Desire is a doorway. You guys remember when Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Right? Remember he said that? And then all these things will be added unto you. Remember when Jesus said that? Because he was saying in the same tense, you know, it was written, he will give you the desires of your heart. But only for those who dwell in the kingdom, right? You see, if you dwell in the kingdom and you desire something for the kingdom, you open the door to the kingdom. But if you don't dwell in the kingdom and that door of desire opens up within you, you don't know what you have just opened. And all too often it breeds darkness. 
In every single case, darkness is a result of a desire that's not focused on the kingdom. The sad part is, in a lot of cases, it looks harmless. It's very harmful. So through the assemblage of folks and unity, you see, they unify people through television. They do. They unify people. Everybody watching at one time, everybody discussing the same thing, everybody's desires beginning to unify, either for or against. That's a ceremony, right? And so when you become involved in these ceremonies and your desires become like the world's desires, you participate. You begin to energize those same destroying powers you war against. And when you do that, you cannot rebuke them because now you're a participant in them and you have to be clean again before that happens. So then a lot of people, they have noticed, Christians, during the elections, once they withdraw, it's like their anointing comes back. While they're in it, it's a strange type of, of sensation. They, they have days of strange sensations. But when it's over for a while and a Christian begins to draw back from it, their personal anointing seems to come back to them. In other words, your whole spirit changes again. You lay that aside. Love enters back in. Uh, soberness. You begin to see the truth. Right? Right? And in that respect, you have to be careful because I tell you, every single day of your life, there's something trying to pull you into some type of a, a ceremony. Something will always do that. Principalities and powers do this all the time. They try to get you to open up the doorway of desire. And it's not for the kingdom of God. You see, that doorway of desire for the kingdom of God is called love. Not this misplaced love. Not love in false things, love in the truth, which is always connected to Christ. Any other doorway is not to the kingdom. There's no one that can actually enter into the kingdom of God absent Jesus Christ. No matter who they are, they can't do it. And that makes those folks who actually partake in the kingdom of God, that's a very small number. It's a small number. Not a big number, it's a very small number. Even of those who are Christians, it's still a small number. Many are called, few are chosen. Few are chosen because they don't enter the doorway of Christ. Because it's impossible to enter. There are certain things that are impossible. But that's a lesson for another time. Right? So what I'm telling you is this. That doorway of desire also coincides with disturbances. The electromagnetic feeling of the earth, oh boy. This is where you have to have data points, ladies and gentlemen. In the science team that we have, every day, data points have been collected. Every day. And the reason why is because there, there, if you, once you chart that data, and you look at politics, world events, things of that nature, you begin to see a pattern, correlation between the two. The change in programming on television, I'm telling you, you see a pattern. You start to see a pattern. And then you scratch your head and you say, well, how can this be? And you begin to understand it, right? So that's working. That's why data points are important. Historical data points are important. You can always use that data to analyze a truth. Now remember, to see a truth, you cannot see the whole truth in one day. And that's part of our problem too. A lot of people don't believe we live in the end days because of reflecting upon the events of the world over the course of a year. You can't do that. In order to find out what season you're in, you have to analyze at least 10 to 15 years. You can't do it by one year. 10 to 15 years will show you a solid trending thing you begin to see. Right? Once you analyze that 10 to 15 years, well, now you're beginning to have clear sight. 
on what's actually taking place. That's right, Mayor, same with quakes. And th that's why those data points and historical data are so important to store them. That is valuable and critical information, and it can really help someone. A lot of people, and I know certain people in the science team, well, why is, he, you know, why is he so interested in these data points? And it's not so much forecasting the next quake. No. That's useless. Right? To a big degree, that is useless. But when you begin to analyze, and then you relate those things to human activity, there's no denying something supernatural, which means above the natural that most people are familiar with, is taking place all the time. We just simply can't observe it, right? You guys with me so far? Hmm? You with me? So the magnetosphere is very important to us. And through the collection of data, you can see certain things that just don't make sense. But let me make it short. With the collapse of the magnetosphere, something will happen to your brain. A long time ago, when they were sending cosmonauts up, I told this story before I'm telling it again. They did not replicate the magnetic field of the Earth in the craft. And guess what happened? The people who went into orbit went nuts. That's what happened. All right? It happened. When they went nuts, I mean, they just went nuts. Come to find out, you can't function without the replication of the Earth's shielding up there. You can't function like that. Because your neurological connections are largely electrical by nature, by nature. And they begin to break. And when that happens, you really do drift. You, there's no way you can tell truth from fantasy or fantasy from truth. You, they were reporting all sorts of weird things. Even with the magnetic uh, replication, you still begin to see through reality. You see right through it. You see things you don't want to see. So you have to have special training. Because you're going to see certain things, right? But they found out early that um, when these cosmonauts came back down, they were ra ravaging, raving lunatics. They were like animals. I mean, they had no, they, they couldn't, um, they just weren't people anymore. They were something else really were something else but prior to them going crazy they reported seeing vortices and all sorts of weird things and this brings me to CERN other tests and experiments were done by both Germany Russia and the United States concerning the Earth's magnetic field they know how critical it is that they replicate it properly, that the human body can function, because your spirit will begin to drift into another dimension. Come to find out, just to make this short, just ponder this, the magnetic field is a veiled barrier. In other words, with it, we are protected from another dimension. It, the entry and the exit of things here is minimal based upon magnetic field. Now I'm going to give you another correlation. Since when CERN activates, there, there are always reports of people having vivid dreams, reporting uh, things walking around, all sorts of paranormal activity increase when CERN is powered up, Right? It also happened in New York, and it happens in New York when they power it up. They have to put it underground to a certain depth so that those magnetic field lines will not affect you guys walking around and everything else, right? Because they begin to curve those field lines. I'll explain that a little bit later. Because they're very, very important. In fact, 
a lot of the money at CERN went into the magnets. You guys know that? These particle accelerators, cyclotrons and things, a, a lot of money goes into the magnets. Magnetic modules and, and, and computing those fields, right? a lot of money goes into that. Because that is a way that you can control or let's just say capture and sustain particles. That's how they do it. <clears throat> Through magnetics, you can direct a proton. Without, the, without magnetics, you cannot do it. Right? So even with that example, you can see that the magnetic shielding around the Earth is very important because it can direct um, highly charged particles. All right. Also, for a long time now, they've been experimenting on a quantum level, going to other dimensions, seeing what in the world is the imbalance. What is this imbalance? In other words, for every, if you had a battery in this dimension and it produced what, 1.2 volts, standard battery, right? It's, let's just say it's twin. In the other dimension would produce 3,000 times more voltage than the one over here. But it would weigh a lot less, and this one weighs a lot more, and it would be, you know, 300,000 times smaller, while the battery over here is bulky. That's what they discovered. But you just can't go and peer into another dimension and on the quantum level. You have to control the opening. See, with that type of imbalance here is what if you happened to open up a dimensional door, let's just say you happen to open one, right? And you took something from that dimension, <clears throat> it would require a bunch of stuff from this dimension to balance it out. Then that door would shut. So how do you do that? How do you manage that balance? It's almost like you reaching into a glass of water, right? And you attempt to lift a bubble out. Well, you know that's not going to work. Because as soon as the bubble is going to come up, and as soon as you obscure that bubble, it's going to fight even harder to come up, and then poof, it opens all the way up. You can't contain or control that, but you can under pressure. Given the right pressure, you can control bubbles, right? So what are they doing? On the quantum level, that dimension is, is, is more like you're dealing with radiation than anything else, but you're dealing with elemental uh, components of energy itself, energy and light. It takes a very strong magnet to do that. Just like your phone. Your telephone is not going to work unless the, in, unless the electrons can be controlled, bottlenecked in certain places, open up in other places. It just simply won't function. You would not have the efficiency of, of, of your your lithium battery or anything else if they did not control the flow of the electrons and the protons based on what theory you believe in. So what I'm telling you is this, just like electronics relies upon the fact that you can control electrons, both their potential and speed or, or potential, uh, let's just say their flow, their potential and flow and heat management. You have to deal with dimensions in a like manner. Now, don't let that word dimension fool you. Don't let it do that. Because in your phone is a dimension. It's right there in your phone. It's in all electronics. Because on a type of quantum level, when you're dealing with electrons, whether you believe in the electron theory or proton theory, when you're dealing with those small components, you still have to manipulate them, control them, and you have to do that through magnetism. You have to do that through restraints, conductive materials, silicone. And you have to utilize all these things to manage it. So then the magnets at CERN are very critical to CERN. Because we're working on such a small scale that if you put a pinhole, if you put a tiny pinhole, into another dimension. You could extract out of that pinhole enough power to sustain the earth, I don't know, for a hundred years. 
So you're dealing with a lot of raw power that's not well understood. But magnetism is the key. So magnets not only act to direct charged particles, but they do shield other dimensions from freely flowing into this one. So it truly is a shield. Just like when those cosmonauts and certain astronauts went up into space and they began to see the vortices until the replication modules were turned up a little bit more and then they went away. So what does that tell you? That means the absence of an electromagnetic field will cause your spirit to drift. You, you go outside of the set balances of the human body and you begin to see other places and other things. You begin to see a lot of things. You know what's so funny that it will be okay if one astronaut saw something. Right? Or two saw something totally different one to another. It's a different subject when all of them see the exact same thing. And as soon as a magnetic field is strengthened, they don't see it anymore. So through a magnetic field, the veil, the veil can be cracked. And people peer through. So one of the keys to what a lot of people do has to do with electromagnetism. Now, it's all over this earth, isn't it? And I, I, I'm trying to explain to you that in the times of the Bible, at certain specific times, that magnetic field collapsed. And when it collapsed, a lot of supernatural things happened. It became physical every single time. Guess what? It's going to do it again. And again, the veil will be ripped the veil is going to be opened. And it would appear that the controlling component to this veil is the magnetic shielding of both the earth and the sun. There are spots in the Bible where it says that men will be stricken with a type of madness and their horses with blindness. Now, when you analyze that, we don't ride horses. We have GPS. In order for a GPS to no longer work, but the satellite is still up there. The properties have changed. Magnetic properties, field lines of force have changed. If that happens, then that little device is going to be calibrating for a long time because it functions based on time. And if the time is not synchronized, your readings are going to be off. Therefore, your GPS is going to be blind. It's not going to work. Time can be altered through magnetic fields or restrained. A small deviation in, the, in timing, like um, we get our timing from both crystals and radioactive decay. Right? But the electromagnetic field can alter radioactive decay and it can alter the natural frequencies in any crystal. So then if it begins to alter time, our perception of time will alter. Electronic devices are not going to work right. GPS will be dead. Hence, the horses are going to be stricken with a blindness. And their riders with madness. If the, if the electronic, or I'm sorry, the electromagnetic field lines collapse, the human brain is going to be affected. So people will run around in a type of madness. Are you guys, are you, are you seeing that? Oh, my did I explain that well enough? You see, you know what? Do you see how when you read the Bible and you, you stop trying to rationalize the Bible and you just leave it be? In time, things revealed. In time, in their time. Because knowledge prematurely is often lost. But in time, you begin to understand. Now, how could they understand that? A long time ago, they couldn't. It wasn't for their time. It's 
somebody has to help me find that scripture. You guys help me find that. I'm going to say that one more time because certain people didn't get it. I just saw somebody say something about cats. So I'm going to explain this uh, uh, again as best I know how. I believe that's in. Let me see. I think I got it. Let me pull up my little. Uh, when the riders, um, when the riders are stricken with, uh, uh, or the horses are stricken with blindness and the riders with madness. Somebody help me out and, and find that. Can you do that, please? I don't have all my resources here. And I can't remember scriptures for anything. I'm telling you, unless I get, uh, you know, fired up, but it's not mine. Somebody look for that. Somebody with, uh, come on, gentlemen. Where are these guys at with the digital Bibles? But that's a very real episode in the Bible. Right? Is that uh, Zechariah 12.4? Okay. Let's go to uh, Zechariah 12.4. Let's, let's go check that out. Can we do that? Who sent me that? Thank you, by the way. Okay, it says, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. There it is. What happens? Where's that word come from? Uh, Timahon. Timahon is that astonishment word. In other words, a horse astonished or a horse. A horse that's overwhelmed does not know what to do. Hence, that's why certain translations will say blindness. And there's another story of this where blindness is actually used. And it's rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes by the house of Judah and will smite every, every horse. Listen, and, and, or, uh, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. There it is. Now, is every vehicle, of, we don't have horse. What, do you have a horse? Do you guys have, I know we, I know they haven't, uh, Fort Hood, right? I know with the first, second cavalry divisions, but we're, we're talking about something else here, folks. The nature of this conversation, or what was, what was being recorded, Zechariah, Right? Is when the Lord, okay, it starts out here, 12 1. For the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretch forth the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and formeth the spirit of man with them. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So when they're in the siege, in other words, these folks have seized them. God's going to make them a cup of trembling. And then it says, in that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their hearts, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength and the Lord, the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, will I make the governors of Judah like the like the uh, earth of fire among the wood, and like the torch of the fire in a sheaf. They shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Vehicles won't work. Oh, it gets worse. There are some other worse things in here, too. We don't use horses. We have vehicles. In order for a vehicle to be blind... We have to have the technology of today. Case in point. Do you guys know 2017 this year is the release of driverless vehicles for a lot of companies? Do you know that it is forecasted by the year 2028 or 2025? There will be more driverless vehicles on the street than people driving the vehicles. Do you not know that in 2016 there were a few cars already people are driving around that have the capabilities of being driverless? So you have a lot of companies this year releasing driverless cars. How are they doing this? The accuracy of GPS. Now they have a redundancy system where they can actually see this was this started back in the 80s with DARPA because they had a DARPA challenge for a bunch of uh, universities and colleges and so forth and so on to they had a competition of driverless vehicles. In the United States, they had the competition was steep, and and um, they had a lot of uh, universities involved, and these cars had to navigate a track without human intervention and avoid obstacles. 
right? So it was on the fly programming, too. They were not pre-programmed to drive this course. They were not. <clears throat> now they have perfected them. And you do see them. And they're on the market this year, going on the market. But if something happens to their GPS systems, well, then the, how are the cars? They're not going to know where to go. Somebody says, what about jets and planes? Planes already, you, you know what, the, the, um, the automatic pilot and civilian aircraft, right, is equipped with a go-home feature. And they're equipped with so much. It's so much so, they're equipped so much so that a lot of civilian pilots, they do get lazy um, because the, the aircraft itself is doing a lot of work, right? Doing a lot of work. VJ says, Michael, isn't it just the attackers who will be struck by the Lord? Well, now, this is where you have to analyze this, VJ, because look, this happens during the siege. And, and this is why these little words are so important. It says, behold... Zechariah 12, 2, read it with me carefully. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So when the people, remember Jerusalem has to be trampled underfoot for 40 and two months, right? Three and a half years. How long is their siege? Three and a half years, right? So we, we have to think of this. In the context in which it was written. So when they're in the siege, then Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling. Then the Lord looks down. Let me, let me get the Bible here because I love those. That was a good question. <clears throat> I'm going to get something here. You guys ready? You guys ready for this? All right. So we see this during the siege. During the siege, God makes them a cup of trembling. Right? Even in the book of Joel, the Lord says this. In the book of Joel, chapter chapter 2, the, the people said, it, it said, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to a reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. When they're in the siege, you see, Joel 2, I know a lot of, listen, folks, I'm not going against what anybody else said, right? I can't do that. I can only go with what the Lord has revealed to me, right? And this isn't a question of, you know, that person's right and I'm wrong or I'm right and he's wrong or she's wrong or who, that's not the case. In time, all things are revealed anyway, Right? But I have to be responsible with the word. I, I When I read something, I don't grip onto it right away. It's, ooh, yes, that's truth. Let me tell everybody, no, no, because I'm scared to do that. I'm telling you the truth. This is not my word. And if, you, if I teach a lie or something like that, or if I give my own spin to it or something like that, I'm in trouble. I'm not, I don't think about anybody else in that respect. This is God's word. This is what he allowed us to read. This is what... He had to, he purposed the King James Version of the Bible to be here, to go out to so many, but I'm not going to alter anything. Not going to do it. Yeah, I'm just not going to do it. So anyway, in chapter 2 of Joel, what's it say? Now, I just read the last part to you. In chapter 2, that was verse 17 and 18. When the Lord looks, listen, it says, When the Lord, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. When will he do this? When the priests or weeping between the porch and the altar. And now they're praying, saying, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach. Why are they saying this? Because they're under siege. That's why. These are the days of the siege. God also calls these days the days of indignation. These are the days in which they must undergo then the Lord said, I will be satisfied. But this is the very declaration in the book of Jeremiah that the Lord revealed he would not turn away from. He would not undo this one. He wouldn't undo it. He set a people in his first fruits called Israel. And they defiled it. He gave them everything. 
They defiled it. Okay? So let's stay on point here. In, in Joel chapter 2, you hear about an army that scares the occupants of Jerusalem to pieces. In Joel chapter 2. It says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound alarm. My holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is not hand. Now, let me ask you something. I, I know what I, I know. Certain people have said certain things. OK. And, and we're, this is not a competition. I, I can't give you what I don't. But the Lord has not revealed to me. Right. But it says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. It did not say sound an alarm over in Samaria. It didn't say sound an alarm in Egypt. It did not say sound the alarm in Jordan. It didn't say go to Lebanon and sound the alarm. It said sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Why would the alarm be sounding in his holy mountain? The holy mountain, by the way, is Jerusalem. So the event is where the alarm is sounded. It says, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is not in a day of darkness. And it goes to explain the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. You ready? It is a day of darkness and gloom. It's a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong there had not ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. See, this same thing is uttered also in the book of Jeremiah, the army of the north that will assemble in the end days, coming to accomplish something against Jerusalem because God declared it. So I had one person one time <clears throat> when I, I made this statement, I said, God will use. He will use his creation to exact whatever he wants. And so then often. He has used or will use Assyria to be his axe in the Middle East. Well, somebody got upset. God's not going to use evil people to do evil things. Trying to point this person to scripture where God said, the Assyrian is going to be my axe in the Middle East. And then because he lifted up himself like he did it and got a little too prideful, then I'm going to chop him down. So what I'm telling you is this, God does use things that stand against him for the sake of his word because all things belong to him. Have people gone nuts? All of creation belongs to the Father. Who does Satan belong to? The Lord God Almighty. Who do the fallen belong to? The Lord God Almighty. Every atom, every molecule, everything belongs to the Lord God Almighty. Your cell phone made from the materials of earth or even space. All that stuff came from what? The Lord God Almighty, his creation. Nothing can exist unless he permits it. And all things belong to him because all things came from him. We have got to grow up a little bit. This is how we get things out of context. And this is why I hear people say, well, God's trying to do so and so. No, he's not. God either does or he does not. He does not try anything. Don't humanize God the Father. God is spirit. That's why we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Sometimes we make huge mistakes. We humanize too many things. And we teach others to humanize it. God is beyond our perception. We cannot hold his perception within ourselves. That is impossible. In the day the Lord will come. This army he sends. Says the fire devoured before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape. Now, where are they running to? This, this is what you have to ask yourself. Where are these guys going? Well, the alarm is sounded in his holy mountain. All of a sudden, there's an army. There has not been the like. Where? You're about to find out. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains. Shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble? A strong people set in battle array before their face. The people shall be much pain. What people are going to be much pain? Where is this army going all over the place? All faces shall gather blackness. 
They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one in his own ways. And they shall not break the ranks. They will not deviate. Break the ranks is a term used. It was a military term used. It really is. And Joshua knew about it too. To break your ranks means you deviate from your military objective. That's what it means. You deviate from your... This means they are focused. They are going. They are set forth to accomplish something. Right? They shall march everyone on his way and they shall not break the ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They won't betray one another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they shall fall upon the sword, what is, what is the sword? What is the sword, you guys? Anybody know what the sword is? The sword is war. The sword is war. In this context, the sword is war. You live or die by the sword. It's war, and those things are the weapons of war. They shall not be wounded. Now I looked at this. And then you look at Revelation and you see what's released upon the face of the earth. You know that the beast descends out of the bottomless pit and all of a sudden he's in Jerusalem. Then why would I say he's in Jerusalem? Because he kills the two witnesses. When he comes and reveals himself, he's going to be in Jerusalem. Lord help us. He will overcome the two witnesses and kill them. They will lay dead in the street. Where did he kill the man? Jerusalem. He is also the same one that sets up the abomination that makes it desolate. He shall cause oblation to cease. They shall run to and fro in the city. This is Joel 9. To and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the house like the... Uh, uh, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. That is the term I want you to see. The earth shall quake before them. Now, I want you to highlight that. Write that down. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. That phrase right there. Right there. This is even better one. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. The way this is formed, his army is also explains. Those are people of his usage. A lot of people said, well, this is God's army. Yes, it is God's army. But it's not what you think it is. Who prepared the northern army in the book of Jeremiah? God revealed to Jeremiah that God did so. He declared it. Just like when you read in Revelation the 200,000 thousand that are released. Just like those things that are sent out of the bottomless pit are still under the command of the Lord God Almighty. Even the ones that Apollyon is king over, they did not go forth to do anything to the righteous but to the unrighteous. They were commanded not to hurt any green thing or any tree, nor those who had the seal of God on their foreheads, but only those men who didn't have the seal of God on their foreheads. You see, all those things that were cut loose, they were cut loose against those who don't have Christ, who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. You see? They're under command. Apollyon is inside the pit with those things. The, the angel with the key to the bottomless sent, a pit was sent. In fact, that same angel also later on in Revelation binds up Satan for a thousand years. All things are under God's command. You cannot read Revelation like somehow the beast is out of control. Even the ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet but will one hour with the beast. They have agreed to give their kingdom unto the beast for one hour. Why? Because God has put his will into their hearts to do so. So the unification of the beast system is under God's command too. You see? 
God put it in the heart of them to fulfill his will. That's also in Revelation. Don't ever think somehow God has not orchestrated all things in existence because he has. And that includes your enemies. Hmm? God orchestrates all things. And I'm telling you now, your response to this life is everything. You know what? The Lord, can I just say this bold statement? I feel emboldened by this statement. Your life is not, it is not about what somebody did to you. That will never be mentioned at the judgment. It's about how you react to them. That demonstrates who you are. Your life is about how you react to them. That's what your life is about. Back to this army. You guys want me to give you a spoiler or two? You ready? Concerning this army? Because it does say God's army, doesn't it? Doesn't it say God's army? Right? That is Joel, because some people, somebody's not convinced. I'm going to just show you. That's Joel chapter 2, right? 11. And it reads, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his, before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide? It says, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. And of great kindness and repented him of evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing, uh, blessing behind him. Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord Weep between the porch and the altar. Stop. Why would the ministers and the priest of the Lord, <clears throat> why would the uh, solemn assembly be called if this is a good army? Why would the ministers weep between the porch and the altar if this was a good army? Their faces are gathering blackness, these people are, because of this army. This army was sent forward to accomplish the will of God. So this army that comes upon the land may not be what you think it is. It is pestilence. Do you guys know what a pestilence is? Do you know what that is? A pestilence can be human beings too. That is an assembly of something that just utterly consumes pestilence. Now, I hope you highlight it. Joel 2.11. Because I'm going to give you a spoiler. You ready for this? Joel 2.25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. There's this great army. Pestilence. You guys catch that? That's funny. All the typing stopped in the chat room. Well, highlight those two for yourselves. Highlight them. You know why? Because the formation of this, you're now seeing. You're hearing the policies of the formation of this army that will surely be sent. With your eyes, you will see. You will see the beginning. My goodness. And that's when, listen, after the Lord sends his army, after they gather a solemn assembly, after the bridegroom goes forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet, you know who that speaks of. Why would that be thrown into there in Joel 16? I'll tell you why. You ready? Here's another sobering thought. When this northern army 
comes upon the land. For remember, the indignation is for three and a half years. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot for 40 and two months. When this army is sent, guess, listen what he's saying. Joel 2.16, gather the people, sanctify a congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. And then all of a sudden he says, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. What does that have to do? That makes no sense to throw in. That makes sense. When I first read this, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. stop. That makes no sense. We're talking about people gathering themselves together, Lord, repenting in truth, understanding that they have messed up, really calling out on your name. What in the world does the bridegroom and the bride have to do with anything? And then I kept reading in the Bible and I saw something over and over and over and over again. Many of you are terrified of what you call the great tribulation. You are terrified. I am not. I don't have the escape attitude. Because tribulation is not appointed to me. Here's what I saw over and over again. The day of the Lord is horrible for the people who did not have Christ. But the day of the Lord is the victory and the redemption of those who truly walked with Christ. Those who say yes to the Lord now, those who have stopped complaining about their lives, have completed their path. And when this time comes upon the face of the earth, that's when the bridegroom goes forth. You see, because only the Father can command the bridegroom. Only the Father can do that. And he is the one that will send his angels to gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. And so he says, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. You're in the closet right now. And you don't like the conditions of the closet. But when this time comes upon the world, Jesus goes forward. That's what I kept seeing over and over, is that the day of the Lord is the victory for the children and the demise of the earth. So the real message is what have we to fear if we are our father's children in truth? Ladies and gentlemen, that's why I will not complain now. I'm very thankful because of this understanding. And believe me, I have no complaints in my life. You don't hear me complain. People who know me don't hear me complain. Do you know why? Because the Lord is raising me now. And when this day comes, if you know the Lord, you'll call upon him. If you don't, you won't. So I will not live by fear. Fear is not mine to keep. So I don't have it. This army that comes upon the earth has been prepared to do so. It's been prepared. And when the Lord, after this happens, look what the Lord does. He says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity the people. Uh-oh, that's Joel 218. So when he's jealous for his land and pities the people, what did he do? What did he just do? What did he do, you guys? I'll read it to you what he did. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. He's going to cut them to pieces? Who are you going to cut to pieces? 
Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and Jerusalem. The Lord says, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, and smite it with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. That means the Lord is looking now. He opened up his eyes. Now he's looking, and the earth is in trouble. When God opens up his eyes and looks at a situation, it is either fully consumed or it is embraced. You see, we have Christ. We have an advocate with the Father. And through the eyes of the blood shed. In other words, the blood is a filter. The Lord sees the redeemed. Without the blood, he sees massive sin, rebellion, and unruly creation. All who do not have Christ for real, if God looks upon you, after an appointed time. There is no salvation for you. Because he will see you. Those who have Christ. He's not going to see your flesh nor deeds of the flesh. But the redeemed child. And he will make you as he sees you. So if you're covered by the blood. You will be like him. He will make you as he sees you through the blood of the Lamb. You won't see how that works. But without the blood, you become condemned like your flesh. Hmm? You guys see that? And I'm telling you, all this is God's doing. Now, because I, I could just... Somebody out there can't get this. Let me let me give an example because all things God has done himself. The beast can only be the beast because God has set it up in the first place. God set this up in the first place. The indignation, the trampling of Jerusalem for 40 and two months. God has set this up. You don't believe me? Hmm. Here we go. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now do you see that? The beast can't do anything without the creator's design and play. Folks, I'm telling you, there is nothing out of control. Stop squandering your time as though Satan somehow can do what he wants to do, and demons can do what they want to do. They cannot do what they want to do. Now, what is this? For God hath put it into their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God should be fulfilled. What is it? What words need to be fulfilled? And this is why we did the study in the book of Jeremiah. The words that have to be fulfilled is the indignation against Jerusalem. Now why does it have to be against Jerusalem? I'll tell you why. God took a chosen people he fully adopted. He washed them. He cleaned them. He set them into his own land. And they defiled his land and made his heritage of reproach. And then they became stiff-necked and would not ask for forgiveness. So he sent them into captivity, into Babylon. And even there they corrupted themselves even more, being called the daughter of Babylon. And then they came back with more corrupted things, with atonement and all sorts of fairy tales. So then at the end, the Lord said, I will purge my vineyard. And he prepared a beast to go and purge his vineyard. And that purging, pur that purging of the vineyard is called the indignation of the Lord. He says that after the indignation is complete, 
then all those who came against Jerusalem will suffer the consequences. You see, all those being drawn down to the Valley of Decision, look what they did. Look what they did. Joel chapter 3, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Jeru Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel. His heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So they did part the land anyway. And the true nation is scattered and people don't even... How is the true nation scattered? Did we not learn about the grafting into the branch? Did we not learn about the statements when it says, I know you're in that place and they say they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan or up, they are the synagogue of Satan. Because if you're grafted into the branch, you're now an inheritor of the kingdom which makes you what? Royal children. See, you don't even know. When you were grafted in, you're no longer adopted. You're a part of. Do you understand? You were adopted to be grafted in. Once you're grafted in, you're a real Jew. Uh-oh. Now you're a Jew. The real Jews, not the fake ones. The real Jews. Lord, give us some understanding and take this offense away from us. The Lord is preparing this earth. He's preparing the earth in accordance to his word. Not mine, not yours, not anybody else's. And it will be done. His will is always going to be done in this earth the same way it's done in heaven. And it will come to pass. And nothing in your life is without purpose. All things in your life have purpose. And of course you don't understand all of it. We're but children. But you're supposed to pop out on the other side. Seeing your heavenly father. You're developing character. You're being exercised. Your royalty in training. So if you're royalty in training, stop complaining. Somebody's going to use that if they hear this archive. God has all things within his command. Having said that about all things in his command, mankind can't do anything without the approval of the Father. They're not going to successfully open anything nor shut anything without God's approval in his timing. They're not going to have a war when they want a war. You know why mankind seeks to control so desperately every day? Because they're not in control any day. Our Father in Heaven is in control of all things, all the time. And now they must endure something. You know what the Lord said? I'm going to tell you what he said. The Lord will famish all the gods of the earth. That's Sapphiniah too. What does that mean? I'll tell you. Every single thing you trust in in this world. Your resources and preparations, gold and silver. Are going to be exhausted. They're going to be done away with. These will not be good days, and mankind is not prepared for it. Nor, according to prophecy, they will never be prepared for it. You know what makes us different from them? 
we know who to call out on in truth. Saying his name won't cut it. Even in the book of Joel, there was something else written that cannot be overlooked. Here it is. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. That is Joel 2.14. What does that mean? Oh, so here it goes. You guys ready? God knows who's going to call out upon him just to save their behind. Those who call out on the name of the Lord to be saved from the circumstances will die in the circumstances. And that's why your circumstances are not answered now, because you cry out with the same falsehood. But those who cry out for the Lord, because they do not want to be separated from his love, his greatness, and that sense of family. That one who cries out, always cries, giving all. And they cry out in truth. You see, the meat offering and the drink offering solidifies the act in the first place. That resides within your heart. Your brain will say, call out on him to save your skin. You've done so out of fear. His children will call upon him because they love him and they trust him because they desire him and have desired him. The ones who will perish will only call to him to save themselves. Right now in your life, people are called, they have messed up the definition of save. Jesus came for what? The purpose of salvation. Salvation and saving yourself from something you're going through are two different things. Can you see it? Can you guys see it? To save yourself from something and ask the Lord to do so implies doubt in your mind. But when you call upon him that you may have salvation, you have called upon him. Can't you see that in your life? The example is in your life. When you call out on him to save your skin. That's totally different from calling out on him for the sake of salvation. All of us have called on the name of the Lord to save our skins. And we still went through things. But some of us have called out on the name of the Lord. Because we want to be saved. And the only way a person can call out on the name of the Lord to be saved is to realize that they're doomed. You see, when you realize you're doomed, you don't care what you're going through. You don't want to be saved from the circumstance. You know that your soul is hell bound. You're not trying to get yourself out of anything. The realization has just struck you in the face that your soul is damned. And you begin to repent and consider many things in truth. And you beg the Lord to forgive you. Because you see how rotten you've truly been. And you don't care to be delivered from the trouble you're in at that time. You care that your soul be saved. That's when you call out on the name of the Lord. That's when I called out on him.
repent, calling out on the name of the Lord. And it was already written, those who call out on the name of the Lord during those days, they'll be saved. Only when you realize who you've actually been, can anyone truly call out on the name of the Lord. And I'm telling you now, you don't care about circumstances or anything else at that time. You don't. Because you know at that time you deserve it. See, the, listen, the false heart says, I don't deserve this. And they're calling out on the Lord to alleviate their pain because they think they don't deserve it. The true call to the living God, you already know you deserve that and worse. So you're not concerned about that. But you know you have sinned against the Lord. And you call out to him. And you tell him and confess all things. That's calling out on the Lord. That's calling upon his name. You call upon his name for the purposes of salvation. And these days, even now, be careful of your footing. The emotional atmospheres. And most importantly, be careful of how you call out on the name of the Lord. Reverence him in truth. Rend your heart and not your garment. Do you guys know what that means? I just told you. When you rend the heart, you realize you deserve to be killed. But you also begin to witness the separation because you sinned against the Lord. To rend your heart and not your garments is to have a mind, heart, soul, and body of repentance. Not to save you of a situation. That is rending your garments. Garments are physical, but your heart, well, that's a different matter. For anybody out there, I'm going to tell you something. Right now, if you messed up everything in your life up to this very moment, and if you called out on the name of the Lord, With a true heart of repentance. He will hear you. He will answer you. He will raise you up. And you will never be lost again. Because it's bad to walk in this world. And proclaim to have Christ. But inside you know you're lost. There are people sometimes you can walk by them and you can discern that spirit upon them. That's a, that's a bad place to be because these people hold things in. And they become deeply ashamed at who they, they can't even confess that. But I'm telling you in the privacy of your own home. Doesn't matter if somebody's there or not right now a sober mind turn back to him in all truth every single day I come to a realization of thanks because I know I don't deserve the day and I do have a repentant heart so I don't defend myself Not by way of words. But I do not want to be separated from the love of God. I do not want to transgress the eternal law. With all of his goodness bestowed upon my life, I want to conform to all of what is pleasing unto the Lord. Because he loved me before I could conceive of him. That's why. Don't walk through life with these heavy chains. These things in the word of God will surely come. You'll see signs of them. The common man will misinterpret 
what they see in the heavens. You will know. You'll know. But keep a repentant heart. You don't have to go another day deceiving your own heart. You can always open up to the Lord. And I tell you, if it, sometimes there's a time of anointing that will settle down upon your life and you know. It's almost like a call and it says, this is your time. During that time of that anointing, guess what? Addictions can be broken. All you have to do is take that step. Addictions can be broken. Habits can be broken. Things can be resolved. The Lord, during that time when that door is open, will give you the strength, the wisdom, and the guidance to walk with him. He even grants us the strength to walk with him, to follow him. When those times come into your life, right? Step within the kingdom and with him and never be removed. Don't do it. He will always guide you. You are never alone. He will always embrace you. And you're being trained so that you won't be eternally lost. Man will not escape the indignation. Man will not live under the wrath of God. But his children will come out of the closet. And the bridegroom will go forward at the same time. And your redemption shall come. Walk in that soberness today. These people in the world are attempting to do many things, and I'm telling you, they can't do anything until the Lord says they can do it. This is his creation. And I know that many of you, listen, I'm, I'm going to have to iterate this again. Remember that if you are emotionally vested in these things you see on television, these acts of the global community, you're making yourself a partaker of a ceremony and there will be residue upon you from that ceremony. A gateway to that other dimension is desire. Desire is the door. Stay far away from that. You'll see enough with your human eyes. And man will see things that gives them heart attacks. Don't be deceived. Please don't be deceived. These things in the word of God will take place. But with Christ you're secured. Seek him now while I may be found. Call on him in truth. Open the door to the kingdom, which is Christ. Desire him. Ask him for wisdom and knowledge. Seek him out in all things. Have liberty for once. Because you're surely grafted into the branch. Which means you're part of the tree. In truth. yourselves ready to see these things come to pass because they surely will you'll see them the question is what will you do when you see them who will you be after you behold them only you can answer that folks I'm going to skedaddle science team with the small notes about the magnetic field, that's where we're going to go to. Because again, with the collapse in the magnetic field, you will see things that you never saw before. 
Men's hearts will fail them for fear. For looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. The seas and the waves roaring. Every time the, magneto, the, the magnetic field collapsed. Weather phenomena was outrageous. Radiation was outrageous. There were times when people went into the mountains. They couldn't breathe the air. The seas were boiling bubbles on the ocean, on the coastlines. These things happened during the Exodus. All around the world. It's about to happen again. It most certainly will happen. You guys, stay in the word. God bless you. Thank you for visiting us this day. We'll continue this conversation again. We will. We will. Science team, you're going to receive an email likely tomorrow. It's our outline of what we're doing there. Men of Standard will likely touch base. I'll, I'll touch base with you guys tomorrow also. Okay. The shutdown day for COT is going to start Thursday. And it will likely go into the weekend. So we can transfer the rest of the data. During that time, you will not have a user account. Okay? This, this Thursday coming up, you will not have a user account. All right, just remember that so you don't panic. Then you'll have an email for validation and you can respond to it. And the way your passwords are issued and the way you can change them is going to be altered with some different types of verification. It's very easy to do, but very secure. So we're going to do that too. Okay? All right. I want to say God bless you guys. You guys have an awesome evening. Awesome. Angela didn't even tell me to stop this time. Hmm. Something must be wrong. Let me hang up and touch base. <laughs> God bless you all. Hope you all have an awesome evening.